saw an increase in obesity prior to COVID, but we've definitely all joked about the COVID cushion that we now see around many more kids and that COVID curve that we're seeing as everybody has crept up on the BMI charts. Hello, everybody. Josh Rubenstein, Media Director for Kaiser Permanente, Southern California. And this is another KP Candid Conversation. These are conversations with our physicians and our staff about important health topics. And today, a really important topic, and that is our children's health. We're talking to Dr. Cassie Versteeg from our San Bernardino County Service Area. And she knew right away that she wanted to be a doctor at a very young age. So, uh, Dr. Cassie Versteeg, tell me this. First of all, why did you become a pediatrician? <laughs> why did you get into this business? So that one is one that I never have the world's most fabulous answer because I actually chose my specialty when I was in eighth grade. Really? Uh, yes, I did. So it was just I always really enjoyed working with children. And in kindergarten, I decided I was going to be a doctor. And in eighth grade, it was between OBGYN or pediatrics. And when I realized that Pediatrics actually got the better end of the deal in that delivery situation. <laughs> um, I, that's It just stuck and everyone thought I would change my mind throughout residency and I just didn't. The small humans who are so resilient and have so much bright future ahead of them are kind of where my passions just lay. Is it is it common that doctors change their path as they go along, as they do their re they go through med school and and have yeah. that experience of all these different specialties? Yes, most people have very little clue what they want to do for the rest of their life, even if they've chosen medicine, because they haven't really touched it enough. So it's hard to know whether I was just stubborn or whether I was really that uh, aware of, of my desires and passions at that young. So, you know, and I was going to ask you this later, but I'll ask it to you now because this is the, you, you knew you were laser focused on your uh, quest to become a pediatrician. How about dealing with parents? That's got to be a really hard part of being a pediatrician. I would say it's the hardest part, yeah. right? Is that the patient in front of you is actually the easy part. You know, right. yes, it's a little bit like veterinary medicine where they can't tell you exactly what they're thinking or feeling. And you have to do a little bit of deciphering and educated guesswork. But the parents add one to five more patients in the room, depending on who all comes to the visit. And having that many different um priorities, concerns, focuses is really, really tough. So not only am I trying to take care of the problem, but I'm trying to make sure that I allay their fears, make them feel that I'm doing this in an educated way and whatever else may be their backstory and their experiences. When we talk about the health of children, um, one of the first things, um, you know, I have an 18 year old, so I, I, I'm, I'm thinking back to when we had those first visits, right? Um, but it's always about the first thing we talk about are being immunized for everything under the sun. Um, immunization has changed the world. And I think in just the last, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the last three years, we've learned a whole lot about vaccinations that we really, you know, never knew, or maybe didn't even want to know. Um, tell me how that's changed for you and tell me how important it is for children to get vaccinated against a host of diseases out there. Right. So I am blessed that I am the age of a physician that still had a generation training me that saw firsthand all the horrific diseases that United States used to have. You know, so I had leaders and guides that could explain to me what that kid used to look like that I've never seen. You know, that could tell us that you've got H flu epiglottitis, you've got meningiococcemia, and that they used to have patients that would routinely die or that they'd be calling codes on, and that they were so blown away when we got vaccine, and they are so happy that we, as their trainees, have the benefit of not knowing what it looks like firsthand. So I can't imagine a world where multiple patients had polio and people actually knew what polio crutches were like. And you know, I can try and teach people in a textbook, yeah, if you ever see this, it's really bad, but it's hard to explain to people living today not having seen those diseases to understand the priority. And we try and try and try to explain this to people that if we don't continue down this path of prevention, 
we're likely to be back in my predecessor's day where we lived through it by loss of someone close to us or someone we're caring for. And is, is it true that like the, the dealing with this COVID vaccine, um, we've all had to become a little more educated on vaccines over the past several years? Yeah, I do think we've had to, as providers, field a lot more discussions about vaccines. Mm -hmm. I think that COVID brought to the forefront how when a new disease hits that our bodies have no awareness to, it can have terrible, terrible outcomes. I think with the COVID vaccine, though, came a lot of distrust and disbelief of how it came out because people aren't used to new vaccines being created anymore. We've mm -hmm. kind of had this cluster that's been around for a while and anything that hasn't been that people question. And so it's made people challenge medical professionals and challenge the thought of vaccines more so than ever, instead of making them embrace the fact that we have this way to keep people alive. It has led to some challenges on the other side of the coin. So COVID flu, um, give me some of the other basic vaccines that that I have to keep my keep in my mind for my child um, as we start the new school year coming up. Sure. So of course we want everyone protected against chickenpox. While mm -hmm. chickenpox, many parents or grandparents lived through, and it wasn't a big deal before the uh, creation of the vaccine. Over two hundred people died every single year of simple chickenpox from the complications of rapid skin infections or meningitis from it, encephalitis from it. So that's a big one that people may not feel is um, on their forefront of their mind in terms of life altering. We've also got measles, mumps and rubella. That one has gotten plenty of time in the press with some outbreaks in the past five to 10 years in various parts of the country like New York and even Anaheim, California. And um, we've also got polio like I mentioned earlier, one that in the developing world left lots of disability lifelong if you survived it. You've also got one that we are all familiar with, which is whooping cough and tetanus. And so those are our big chunk of right before school vaccines. But in addition, in the state of California, we do ensure that hepatitis B, which is a disease of the liver, is protected against. Uh, we also ensure that children are getting their pneumococcal vaccine to prevent against pneumonias and blood infections, as well as their uh, haemophilus influenza B vaccination, which prevents against epiglottitis and ear infections and some other complications of kind of the head and neck area. And if I'm a parent and I hear that long list of, of vaccines, I should say this is this is a great thing, not a scary thing. Correct. Correct. Um, I just had a parent yesterday who questioned why they should get the meningitis vaccine in their teenager. And they said to me, they've already gotten it once. This was a booster. They said, well, what happens if I don't get it? And I said, well, your child could get meningitis and die. And everyone in the room kind of stopped us. Well, you asked. I mean, that's why I give it to your child is to prevent that disease. And, and so yeah. people forget that it's not just a poke. It's not just a discomfort. It's literally to keep your child from death, dismemberment, et cetera. These things that none of us would want to live with in our hearts, that we had a way to keep our child from going through this. Yeah. And I vaguely remember being in college and getting those notices that someone had gotten meningitis and, and how, how dangerous it is and how you can catch it and everything. So, I, you know, it, it doesn't end when you're uh, an adolescent. A kindergartner. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. no, not at all. Um, here's, a, here's one. How about, how do you get, what's your method for giving a shot to a child <laughs> who might be afraid of needles or parents who are afraid of needles, that kind of thing? What do you do? So I am very blessed in my clinic to have a fabulous nurse who feels passionate about uh, child life. And that is kind of the methods to um, distract, console, comfort children to make uncomfortable things as comfortable as possible. And so she has a wealth of toys and distraction devices, such as I spy cards or little fidget spinners. Um, she also definitely allows parents to hold their child in the position of comfort. If they want to nuzzle them on their lap versus have them lay on the table where it may feel more restrictive, she allows that. Uh, we also can use things like ice to the area. 
or mm -hmm. a cold spray to the area so that it's already a little bit numb. With parents, they often have a fear of discomfort for the child. And I simply say to parents, instead of making yourself think about the downsides, I want you to tell yourself, I'm being amazing. I am protecting my child. By doing this quick pinch, I'm protecting my child. I'm not hurting them. I'm giving them what I want to keep them alive and healthy. And so it's as much the kid's mindset as it is the parent's mindset about this. Tell me this. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit sure. and, and and talk a little bit about um, uh, keeping our children healthy, and that's obesity. Uh, a startling statistic I read, um, the CDC says 20% of all children 6 to 11 years old um, suffer from some type of obesity. Um, is that something that you're seeing in your doctor, in your medical offices? Definitively. So as we have come to be a society of convenience, we have let our diets be that of more convenient and quick foods, which are usually the less healthy things. So combine that with everything that happened during COVID where kids sports activities, their recesses were shut down and we kept them all at home and told them to stay inside. We had a complete increase in 24 hour snacking and zero hour fitness. So we saw an increase in obesity prior to COVID but we've definitely all joked about the COVID cushion that we now see around many more kids and that COVID curve that we're seeing as everybody has crept up on the BMI charts. And is it, what kind of things can we do to, to battle that? Yeah. So what I usually tell my patients is the less things that we can consume that are processed or packaged and the more things we can consume that are produce, so more produce, less package, the healthier our kids will be. In addition, moving, moving, moving. Screens are not great, good for our brains, our focus, our guts, or our rear ends. And so the less screens we can do, I usually say guts and butts. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the less we can do of our screens and the more we can just move our bodies and keep kids busy, that doesn't have to be signing them up for a specific sports program. That can be as simple as saying, let's go take that dog for a walk. It's probably also got a COVID cushion. Let's go outside and let me watch you try out your hula hoop skills. You know, let's just um, learn to ride a bike. My poor seven-year-old just recently learned because we just hadn't thought to focus on it. So some of these things in our garage just need to be dusted off and the kids are so excited that we want to help them learn a new skill or that we're just going to support them and watch them do it. What about uh, just getting ready for school? What kind of things, what kind of steps would you say we need to do uh, to get our kids in, in a healthy place as we start the new school year? Yeah. So this one has been coming up recently as I've talked to some families on summer break is we need to make sure that not only do they have the school supplies or the clothing that they're going to need to feel confident, but we need to work on making sure they're scheduled, that they are getting appropriate rest, that they understand that bedtime can't be midnight when you have to get up the next morning at six or 7 a.m. So starting some gentle limit setting earlier than the night or the weekend <laughs> before school start is super important. And then of Absolutely. course, we love for them to come in for their checkups. Um, a lot of people want to come in for summer when they don't have school, um, but many, many high school kids forget that every year they need an annual physical to be able to play their sports. Mm. And then there becomes kind of a rush on our services and there's only so many humans we can see at a time. So we like to remind families to make sure you've had a physical in that last year. And if not, schedule it before it is an emergency so that your child doesn't have to miss tryouts or the ability to compete in that activity that's gonna keep them healthy. Great tips. And and I guess, give me your uh, two or three top healthy behaviors you'd like to see kids adopt. Just in general, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to do one or two things, what would you like to see as a pediatrician? Sure. So I am very passionate about produce, as I've said already. So I love for kids to strive for five servings of combined fruits and vegetables a day. Okay. Number two, I am all about movement. I want kids moving actively 
actively where you're feeling a little short of breath and sweaty, which isn't too hard to do in Southern California lately, uh, for at least 30 to 45 minutes a day. And number three, I am passionate about water. The less stuff that's in our liquid, calories, sugars, flavors, the healthier we are. I love it. So produce, fill up on produce. Of course, get out, get exercising, get sweaty, and drink plenty of water. Yes, sir. Good stuff. Good stuff. Dr. Versteeg, thank you so much for, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.